Hello and welcome back to yet another test on another single population proportion. So let's just jump into this one. I think you'll find it to be very familiar to you. The process of hypothesis testing here is entirely the same as we saw in problem 94a. The only thing here that really is going to be different is the type of calculations that we need to do for that test statistic, specifically for that standard error. Now, once more, we will go through this, uh, assuming we don't know this information, right? And make sure that we can figure out just from what's in the problem, what the heck is it we're supposed to test. Okay, so we're looking at um, the institution of consumer goods, the consumer goods waste. They found that 60% of products that are returned to a store for refund are not in resaleable condition and are simply thrown away. A local department store sampled 90 returns, so there's our sample size, 90 returns from the previous month and found that 46 of them had to be thrown away. So that right there tells me I'm working with a proportion. Out of 90 returns, 46 of them met this criteria, whatever it is that we're measuring. In the previous example, it was supporting a conservative candidate. In this problem, it's met that criteria. This was being thrown away. So this means our sample proportion here is 0.51. Okay, so we've got a proportion. We know we're doing a test on proportion. The manager is hopeful that her department store does a better job <clears throat> at only accepting returns and issuing refunds on goods that can be resold, meaning that they throw away a smaller proportion of their returns. So, step one, formulate our test. Here again, I'm going to use the letter P because we're testing proportions. This symbol mu means an average population mean. That's not what we're testing. It has no place in this problem. We're testing a proportion. Our hypothesized value is 60%. I always like to write these as a decimal. It just is more consistent with the calculations that we're going to have to do later. Now, are we doing a upper tail test, lower tail test, two tail test? Well, this one's a little bit tricky. It says the manager is hopeful that her department store does a better job at only accepting returns that can be resold. So in, in this context, we have goods that are being returned. They either go in the garbage or they're resold. Here we want to be doing a better job at accepting goods that can be resold, which means that the proportion of goods that go in the garbage is less. So it is less than 60%. So <clears throat> here's how we formulate our test. If the evidence supports the null hypotheses, we're no better than this, uh, I don't know if this is the country or the region, we're no better than 60% going in the trash. If the evidence supports the alternative hypotheses, well now I can say, I the manager, I can say, oh, I'm so happy we're throwing away less than 60% of the goods that are being returned. Okay, we can do this test at whatever level of significance that we want. Reasonably speaking, when in doubt, I choose 0.05. Now we can calculate our test statistic. That test statistic, very familiar. The standard error is a little bit different. This is that hypothesized value, and the sample size. Important to remember that P0 in the denominator, that's your hypothesized value, not your sample value. So this gives me 0.51 minus 0.6, square root of 0.6, 1 minus 0.6 over 90. What's that going to give me? That gives me, oh, that's got to be a mistake, 0.51 minus 0.6 
divided by square root 3.4. One negative one point seventy four. Okay, so there's our test statistic. Same as always. P value approach, critical value approach. Let's go to our Z tables. My test statistic is negative one seventy four. I can come down here. Negative one point seven. And here's my 4. That gives me a value of 0 0.04. We'll just keep it to two decimal places. 0 0.04. So that's simple enough. 0 0.04. Our critical value, if we wanted to use that critical value approach, well, I know alpha here is 0.05. And critical value for that one tail test, we've seen it before, 1.645. Once more, draw a picture. When in doubt, here I have my critical value. Let's see. Oh, this is a lower tail test, so this should be negative 1.645. And of course, we reject if we're below that. We do not reject if we are above. Here's my test statistic, negative 174. According to that critical value approach, we should reject. According to the p-value approach, my p-value is less than the level of significance. Reject. What does that p-value mean? Do we remember? Remember the level of significance. This is measuring my level of comfort towards committing a type 1 error, right? I'm comfortable with a 5% chance of believing the alternative hypotheses, even if it's false. In other words, believing the alternative when the null is true. The p-value, remember this, is telling me my exposure to a type 1 error, my actual exposure if the null is true and if I choose to reject it, there's a 4% chance I just committed a type 1 error. If I'm comfortable with a 5% chance, I'll take a 4% chance. I'm comfortable with a 4% chance, therefore I will reject. My evidence here does support the alternative hypotheses. I have sufficient evidence to say, Mr. And Mrs. Manager, your store is doing just fine. We do have evidence to show that the proportion of returns that your department is throwing away is in fact less than the 60% reported by the Institution of Consumer Goods Waste. Good. And that's all there is to it. Boy, we're getting through these fast now. Hopefully that all makes sense. I hope it's helpful. I hope it's not too fast. Thanks for watching, everybody. Bye-bye.